How's it going guys? I'm Jeremy and today I'll tell you about my experience living in Nepal and then my last trip there which was a pretty cool motorcycle trip. <laughs> So I lived in Nepal in uh, 2007. So this was a pretty interesting time because there was a civil war in Nepal from 1996 to 2006 basically. And I wasn't sure at that time if there was gonna be another war that was gonna break out because it was on and off for several years. And it was a ceasefire at that time. There were elections scheduled, I guess, for March 2008. And so I basically got there in fall and was planning to leave around the time of like those elections. So I had come to Nepal through Tibet on a bike trip. I initially had this accident in China. I broke my femur, I stayed there a year and a half in Kunming. And then after I recovered, after a year and a half, I continued through Tibet for about, I don't know, four or five weeks. And then I got to the border of Nepal. And then, uh, yeah, it was only about two or three days, I guess, to Kathmandu from the border. I had met a, a couple from Belgium that I traveled with a bit. And that was a bummer too, because of course, from Tibet down to Kathmandu, it's all downhill. I think the biggest downhill in the world, something like, you know, 150 or 200 kilometers. But that road was all under construction. So it was just all like, you know, just rocks and potholes and they were doing demolition and trying to make a new road. So I did get to enjoy the downhill too much. Uh, but it was it was interesting to be in a new area because I'd already been living in China as I mentioned for about a year and a half and of course everything in China in uh, Tibet is either Chinese or Tibetan writing you don't have English except for some pinyin sometimes so it was kind of interesting to see you know in, in Nepal you have English everywhere just like in India and stuff and so yeah I remember the one of the first things I like, guess stopping for like lunch or something like that you know I was asking the guy can I have this and I'll take that and the guy's like and I was like, uh, can I have this? And it's kind of like, <laughs> like, what's, uh, is that a maybe? Is that yes or no, you know? And I had no idea that in Nepal and the Indian subcontinent, this is yes. <laughs> so that was my first lesson I learned. And then I came down into uh, Kathmandu, and I knew I would probably be living there because uh, obviously India could have been another option or Pakistan or whatever, uh, but winter was coming. You know, I couldn't leave to do that trip in Tibet until September, October time because, you know, my leg was messed up. I need to get a second surgery and, you know, it was already like November or December almost. So there was no way I was going to be able to cycle from Pakistan to Xinjiang, China through like, you know, the snow and everything like that. So, and I figured it'd be a cool opportunity to hang out in Nepal a few months through winter anyway. The winter in the capital is not too bad. Like, it's kind of cold, but it's not like going to snow or anything like that. So I went down towards um, kind of where people used to stay. I think they used to call it um, either Freak Street or the Hippie Street near Durban Square, kind of south, a few kilometers. Most people stay in Tamil, which is like, you know, here in, in the middle and then basically down, I don't know, a 10 minute rickshaw ride. You got this, uh, this kind of smaller area where, you know, the hippies used to go there, I think back in the day, like 40 years ago or something like that. So anyway, yeah, I'd stayed at that place, I guess, for a couple weeks, and um, I remember, like, yeah, one of the first nights out, you know, I went to some of the, like, tourist bars, because, of course, Nepal's super popular for tourism, and at that time, I guess it had kind of opened up, because there was a break in that civil war, and one of the first things I noticed was that, of course, there were a lot of tourists from, like, Europe or whatever, but I was noticing kind of some things as I went to, you know, maybe some club or some bar, there, there was tons of guys, tons of Nepali guys out, and I saw no women. Now, in the daytime, if you're looking around, I mean, there's tons of women out. The women, um, you know, and, and they're also working in, like, restaurants and different things. So you definitely see a lot of women around, you know, young women wearing different kinds of clothes. And, and Nepali women are quite diverse. You know, you have some that look, you could say, more like Tibetan or Chinese, and some look 
uh, like dark Indian, and some of them could look l like light, uh, you know, like an Italian, a darker Italian or something like that, for instance, or Middle Eastern. So basically, there's quite a, a lot of diversity. They're wearing Western clothing, and so there's definitely some attractive women around. There's, there's like everywhere else in the world, especially if you're at a capital. And I went up to one of the expats, and I, I was like, you know, what's going on? Um, how come I don't really see any women? And he said, forget about it. I was like, okay, interesting. And I don't know if it was in the same bar. I went somewhere else and I went up to another expat. And, you know, this guy, both these guys were there for at least a dozen years or 20, a long time. I was like, how come I don't see women here? And he literally said, like, the exact same thing. He's like, forget about it. I was like, oh, that's a bummer. That's the first minus of being in Nepal. <laughs> you know, not that that's like my only goal, but like, you know, I just generally lived in areas, you know, whether I've been in China or the United States or traveled in Europe. And, you know, I mean, you obviously have the option if you want to date some people you can, you know, it's no problem. And so anyway, no big deal. I mean, you could date like, you know, there's European girls. And I mean, technically you can um, obviously date the girls there and stuff like that. It's just they are not out past 830. <laughs> you know, and part of that is cultural. Uh, but also they had a civil war. And, you know, I mean, up until that time, you know, people were getting kidnapped and killed. I think that civil war killed almost 18,000 people. So, I mean, there's some serious stuff going on right up until I got there. And around that time, too, they had a lot of other problems. Like there was strikes. So the garbage men were on strikes. So all of the streets, you know, were, were, you know, trash everywhere. And it was still pretty warm there when I got there in like October, November. So yeah, the rotten trash, the the dogs, every stray dogs everywhere, and then of course the street kids around, you know, messing with the dog. It's pretty sad in a lot of ways. You know, I hadn't really seen that kind of thing too much uh, ever in like you know China, um, or m a little bit maybe in Southeast Asia, but. Yeah, you, you can walk around at night in Kathmandu, and it is an amazing city because they didn't, you know, in China they basically tore down most of the old city, and they just made a modern city, you know. And in Kathmandu, um, they build up some areas around the outskirts, obviously, but that downtown just is looks the same way it probably did, you know, 2,000 years ago or something. So it is really cool, but it is pretty gritty. And, um, you know, if you walk home at night or places you really got to watch out you know i remember i was walking with one kid you know he fell into the kind of like a ditch or something and it's he didn't get hurt but it's just all crap in there and and so and you don't get much rain in the in the winter because you get the monsoon in the summer so winter there's a ton of air pollution because they don't have the quality controls for you know the mopeds and cars and everything and so you can even feel it kind of like if you'd smell or look at your fingers you could see this like kind of black uh, kind of things on your fingers a little bit and smell like pollution is, is quite bad there Just a tad bit of dirt on my face. <laughs> That's what it looks like when you leave Kathmandu For a few hours fucking miserable <laughs> I even remember it raining like you know one or two times and that was like the clearest day in the world because you know it, it the rain basically gets rid of all of the smog and stuff like that temporarily and so the first thing I needed to do was look for a job, which actually is pretty tough. Um, obviously, it's a really poor country. I mean, they're landlocked between India and China. So how could you even compete with those two countries, right? The two most populous countries. It's landlocked, so you can't easily trade. You gotta fly everything out, or it has to go through India or China. So they rely mostly on tourism for the most part. And so I'm trying to find a job, and it's like, you know, it's probably not too likely I would find anything I wasn't trying to make money as much as just break even until I was able to continue, more or less. And so, yeah, I walked around, and you could see in uh, Dili Bazaar and maybe some other areas, all of the places are for studying abroad. Because everyone, I mean, their, their situation is so desperate. Like, people go and study abroad. I think only one in five actually return. And, I mean, you can't really blame them. I mean, there's just the, the stability and the amount of wages you can make is so small there. It's not... It's not even worth really uh, trying in some ways. And so I kept going to all these different consultants to these basically kind of like a training school or people who are giving advice to people study abroad. And I finally got a place. It was Universal Language and Computer Institute. And so, yeah, a lot of this was people trying to take tests, you know, to study abroad or even get jobs abroad. I think it was a few other things, but mostly to study abroad, either your bachelor's or master's or something like that. And so I, was, I ended up getting the job. It was about $5 an hour. I worked from like 
10 to 4, uh, Monday through Saturday, actually. Or, or it might have been Sunday through Friday. But in Nepal, which is funny, they actually work six days a week. So uh, I'm pretty sure I work six days a week. And yeah, it was kind of funny, you know, because like I said, on the street, there's like a hundred of these places at least. And so what happens is all these students are trying to, you know, check out the different prices and get some ideas. And so this one was the most famous and one of the biggest ones, and of course, probably more expensive. And so they would come in and get free advice from us. And of course, you know, we don't make money unless they actually buy the service, which is to help them apply to schools and stuff like that. And so we would basically be giving them advice on like where to study and this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, they would basically come in. It was kind of funny. And it was kind of like, what is the lowest grades you need? and the cheapest and the easiest to get into. So it was like the bar was at the lowest level. And I mean, fair enough, like they have no money and stuff like that. But it was funny because it was always like, people weren't really trying to ever get into like a really good school or anything like that. They had listened to what everyone else said. And it was funny because I tried to tell them different things like North Carolina is nice and it's cheap or other places that were warmer, for instance, and weren't you know, we're still the same price as anywhere up in a cold area, for instance. But for whatever reason, many of them had talked to language consultancies, including the one I was at, and they were like, Minnesota. And I was like, you know, Minnesota's fine. I'm sure it's great schools, but it's like, why would you go from a, such a tropical environment to like winter, you know? But that, that ended up being a lot of the case. Like I tried to steer them in different directions and they wouldn't really accept different things too much. It was like, they were really stuck with this like Wisconsin, Minnesota, or just some other really small towns in the middle of nowhere, it seemed like. But anyway, so the work was fine. You know, it was it was nothing like real challenging. I just was able to, you know, kind of hang out all day and then, you know, occasionally I'd do some other jobs or maybe teach a little bit or give other people advice or presentations. And then, yeah, the other time, you know, I'd go out a bit, you know, to Tamil and some of the bars and stuff like that. Uh, at this time, too, which they might even, I'm sure they probably have this now, they have load shedding. And basically what this is, you know, they don't have enough en energy in the country, right? Because especially in the winter, as I mentioned, there's no uh, rain. So they don't have a lot of hydropower, probably. So the winter, they have several hours a day. You don't have electricity. So maybe you'll have electricity for you know, like four hours on and then two hours off. And in the evening, it would be the same, you know, they're, I mean, and sometimes it was quite a while because I know, you know, your computer could usually work an hour or two without electricity. So I would usually, for instance, get off work at four and then maybe the electricity would go off, I don't know, let's say six o'clock and I could use my computer for maybe an hour and it might not go back on till like 10 o'clock at night or something. Some of those were like four hours and then in the middle of the night, I think it would be off. Um, so that was definitely kind of a weird thing. Now down in Tamil, they had generators and stuff for the tourists. So you could go down there and obviously they'd have electricity and stuff. So I didn't want to sit in my apartment in the dark, you know, in cold basically. And so uh, that was a reason to kind of want to get out. And it wasn't too far from my uh, place. They gave me a place by the way. The apartment was included. There was actually a Chinese guy uh, I lived with. He worked there too. He went through the Chinese government through a program where they send you to different countries where uh, you basically teach Chinese. And uh, I think he was helping people to study in China. And so, yeah, it was just me and him. It was a pretty big apartment. And uh, yeah, it was just about, you know, maybe a 25 minute walk or so to Tamil uh, or some of the bar areas. And yeah, there was a lot of other foreigners living there. Of course, there's thousands of uh, NGOs and you know people working for the embassies and stuff like that. There wasn't too many people like me. Uh, a lot of people in the Peace Corps too. And so yeah, there's a lot of people you can hang out with. It's generally safe. You know, I didn't hear of any type of violent crime against any foreigners. On New Year's Eve, I did. Uh, I did have a kid run up and uh, I had my camera around my neck. And it was probably only worth a couple hundred bucks. And he grabbed it and ran off. And, you know, I mentioned I broke my femur in the other video. So I'm not quite a fast runner. And, uh, yeah, he, he took off. There was no way. And it's dark. And there's so many people all around. But, yeah, I mean, it's super poor there. So it's uh, not too much of a surprise. And so March was coming along. And I was getting ready to leave. I, I did want to hike, like, either the Annapurna or, you know, check out more of Nepal. Because I was basically just working that whole time. And I only had, you know, one or two days off a week. But the problem was I knew those elections were coming and if the elections didn't go well, then you know there could the civil war might start. 
And basically what it was, it was a Maoist uprising and the leader, I'm not sure if this is how you pronounce the name, Prachanda, he was running. So it was the head of the Maoist army basically was running for president. And the whole thing was they're going to try to get rid of the king basically. And so there was a lot of crazy history, as I mentioned before, not just a civil war, but I guess around 2001, the prince killed his whole family. Like the whole royal family, except for one of the guys who was the king at that time. And so, yeah, you could look up some of the history there. It was insane. And so, yeah, March came and, uh, you know, those elections, I'm not sure, let's say it was uh, March 15th. So I was like, well, I've got, you know, about 10 days I need to get through Nepal or about a week. And so I took off right as those elections were about to take place. I just took the kind of the Southland, you know, I went through some of the hills and the mountains and then they had the Diwali festival, which is where they throw paint at everyone and they have fireworks and it's actually not just one day, it's like several days. And it was kind of funny the first day, but after about, you know, three or four days of people throwing paint at me, like sometimes they come up and like slap me in the face. I was like, come on guys, <laughs> I'm a little bigger than you here. You don't want me to lose my temper. And uh, they block the roads to the kids for like, you know, you can just give them like, uh, you know, small money and they let you pass this kind of thing. But definitely a cool experience. And then I hadn't gone back there for about, I don't know, over 10 years or so. And so yeah, three years ago or so I went back. And I did a motorcycle trip with one of my best friends, Charlie, and my Chinese friend, this girl, uh, Lillian. And it was a rainy season, and uh, yeah, I didn't even realize how bad it was gonna be up there. We went up to like where the Everest base camp would be, that area kind of, maybe not as far as base camp, but the road that goes up that way. And then we did another trip, kind of as much as we could drive, where the Annapurna Trail like kind of begins. And so we had to get like a permit and that kind of stuff before we left. And we got motorcycles for, they are probably only about 20 a, a day for 125. These were more of road bikes, so they were definitely not made for what we were doing. But, you know, whatever, we were able to make it along. Yeah, so it was monsoon season. And, you know, I was used to all these roads in China, which generally speaking uh, are paved and pretty decent. Nepal, those roads to Annapurna and these smaller roads in the country are just uh, like just falling apart totally. It's just basically mud. And at this time too, it was crazy. They changed the law maybe 10 years ago, but people used to actually sit up all on top of the buses. And you'd even hear people, they'd yell around the turns like, whoa, whoa, it's kind of funny. And, but yeah, of course these buses fall off the mountain all the time. And you know, you've got probably 30, 40 passengers inside and like 40 on top. And so, yeah, they ended up changing the laws. I don't, no one could sit up on the top anymore. Yeah, so we were going through like all these rivers and stuff like that and, and mud. And luckily people there were helping us because uh, Man, I mean, it was uh, it was pretty intense. I hadn't seen anything like that before doing motorcycle trips. So, and that's really something you got to consider: is that just because the river you went through on one day was pretty small, if you go to sleep and it rains all night and you're going back in that direction, guess what? It's going to be a raging river. So keep that in mind on your trips. You know, I keep mindful of that uh, kind of thing. That wherever you travel to, when you come back the same way. Things might not be the same, especially these rivers and stuff like that, and especially during rainy season. So luckily we could pay these guys a few bucks and they didn't mind carrying things over. And people would come up to pull us out of the mud and stuff. Um, a lot of the time in China, if you have issues, people just stare or ignore you. Uh, the good thing in Nepal, people will come right over and help you out. So that at least that was cool if you're doing a motorcycle trip. The locals are fantastic as far as that goes. And it's not super expensive to get through some of these areas. So we got up around uh, Johnson area. I think maybe we went past that. And I told the girls with, I was like, man, I don't want you to die with me. <laughs> I was like, if you want, get the flight out of here to Kathmandu. And she did, I was glad, because it was like, there were some rocks falling and stuff like that. So this stuff you gotta think about. If you're gonna go out there in the summer during the monsoon season, it's probably not the best idea for uh, like a motorcycle trip or for some hiking on the Annapurna. But yeah, I mean, that's a great option too. You know, you can hike the Annapurna trails, I think a couple hundred kilometers or something like that. So I think it's like 11 days to almost three weeks. But they have huts along the way, I'm pretty sure, everywhere. And like, you get like macaroni and cheese and like good food, either Nepali food or like Western food along the way, uh, pretty much every day. So at least that's not too bad. You do have one pretty high pass that's like 5,400 meters. So that, that's quite high. I think that's, you know, like 17,000 feet or something like that. So 
uh, people have died on that route, so you do have to be careful. The less popular route, actually, you could go over towards the Everest Base Camp one. Even if you don't do Everest, you could still hike that area, and you could get a flight out there, and that could be maybe a better option for hiking. Uh, the biking's decent. Uh, like some of those roads have a lot of potholes and stuff like that if you're doing like a motorcycle trip or biking, but um, it's, it's not too terrible. And yeah, the people um, in Nepal are super cool. You know, they're laid back. They're a little bit shy in some places compared to India, where like India is a little bit intense. Everyone will come up to you and talk to you. Hey, how are you? Where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. Um, in Nepal, they know English, but they might not all come up to you like, like that right away. If you are going to live there, the only tough thing is that like you'll always kind of feel like a tourist because there are so many tourists there. And most of the other people are doing NGO stuff. So... Like, you know, obviously I lived there about five months and like, you know, I take a taxi home all the time and like, you know, we'd already agreed to the price for me to go to Dilly Bazaar and then when I get there, he's like, oh, this is too far, sir, you know, like I'd like to get more money. It was really pretty frustrating in that regard. I remember, you know, I went to the same guy to get beer like every other day, right? And I forget what it was. It was it's like 60 or 70 a beer. And I mean, I go there every day for weeks or months. And, you know, we try to change the price or something. I'm like, come on, dude. I'm here every day. Like, I know the price. And so that's the only kind of annoying thing um, in any country, not just Nepal. But if you live in an area where it's predominantly for tourists, it's, you're never, it's hard to escape feeling like you're a tourist, you know, and, and being treated that way. And so you're going to have to fight a little bit more with, like, prices and stuff like that. But still, overall, cool time. You know, I, if you were to live there, I'd say, you know, consider one of the smaller cities possibly. Um, obviously, there's some amazing, really beautiful places in the mountains. Probably not much of a social life as far as, like, nightlife and things go. You know, Kamandu's uh, pretty fun. It's definitely, you know, like I said, pretty worn down. You got rickshaws and things that could take you back and forth. You know, it's a little chaotic, but it's still pretty cool. When I was out the last time there, I still didn't see too many of the ladies out. There was a few. Obviously, you could date girls there. You know, I remember I did bring a girl out. I used to go to a place like Sam's Bar, which is good. It's an Austrian woman was running it. I'm sure she still does. And yeah, the guys gave her such a snake eyes. You know, they were they were pissed that like a woman was actually like with me. And those guys all knew me too. And I'd seen all of the Nepalese guys with like, you know, chicks from Europe. I don't give a shit what you guys do, you know. But uh, yeah, they were too cool with that, it seemed like. But um, yeah, overall, it's a cool experience. You know, obviously you can't make much money there. I was able to at least break even. So if you're looking for work, a lot of that's just free volunteer NGO work and stuff like that. And you know, like I, when I talk to other guys that worked for NGOs for a long time too, they had kind of this thing where a lot of the people there are kind of looking for shortcuts quite a bit. And you know, they go to work at an orphanage for a few months. And when they got there, the orphanage, let's say, was in disarray and there was no routine for the kids and for everything, feeding them and all the kinds of things, whatever you have to do. And they would do all of these things to set it up the best way they'd leave for a month or two or whatever and come back and it was exactly how it was before they were there. So that could be a little frustrating if you are going to work with some of these NGOs and stuff. Probably not just Nepal, I think a lot of places in the world. You know, I'm not sure if that's cultural or, or whatever, but a, a lot of these things you try to teach people, it's not always to change certain things. So keep that in mind if you're going to go and volunteer. Yeah, and so I took, you know, probably less than two weeks to bike through the country to uh, India, to the northwest part of India, Himachal Pradesh. And yeah, the election happened a few days later, and they actually ended up electing the Maoist leader, Prachanda. So it was funny, because the two guys I was working with, one of the guys, uh, his father had actually been killed uh, in, in the Civil War or whatever, like got shot in a shop or something like that. But um, the other guy, we were joking all the time because we were like, that would never happen. They would never elect the Maoist. And they, they actually did. And um, yeah, there wasn't a civil war after that. So luckily, um, you know, the country wasn't perfect. It wasn't completely uh, stable in, in all ways. But at least there, the civil war was done, at least. Yeah, so anyway, I hope this video was helpful for you. Definitely check out Nepal. Uh, you know, maybe not the best place to live in some aspects, but definitely somewhere you need to visit. Uh, the people, the food, and the scenery and everything's amazing. And uh, super cheap too, so definitely something to check out.
So guys, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you want to see more content. My channel has a lot of different stuff from uh, my travels around the world, whether hiking or biking, and some of the things over the years I've done, whether I was uh, in the military, uh, commercial fishing in Alaska, or uh, my experience living in China and Taiwan for 15 years, and I was a teacher there and led tours and did all kinds of stuff. So if that stuff's beneficial for you or entertaining, uh, subscribe and I hope to see you next time. Cheers.